So this is a message that I have hearkened back to multiple times over the years, but it comes out of Ephesians, which I know is some, you're not supposed to teach on Ephesians at Ellerslie if you're not Nathan Johnson. That's the way sometimes you feel, because it's just like, wow, I mean, if Nathan Johnson is in the audience, then I mean, he's going to examine this at a whole other level, except for he's not here today. You know? So I have the full freedom to, to talk about Ephesians. And I'm not doing a deep dive into Ephesians, even though some of you might argue that maybe I did. It's a little different way of approaching it, because the way Ephesians is built, it's a letter from Paul the Apostle uh, to the church at Ephesus, is very similar to the way that the book of Colossians is built. And that should be notated by us, because there's a certain pattern of communication that is actually very, very important for our own souls and our development as believers. Because we as believers have a tendency, though we can know the truth up top, we have a tendency to default to certain conclusions, which we don't even agree with, but we have a deep trough in our soul from our natural man tendencies. And that is we have a tendency to do things in our own strength and power. And the whole while we know that that isn't the way it should be done, and yet there we go again. And so... I would like to freshly address that and just to see us elevate our game to a spirit-enabled version of Christianity as opposed to a natural man flesh uh, attempt at Christianity. So this is called The Wrong Door. Uh, when we were putting together uh, graphics, I need to at least give a shout out to Grace McConaughey, who filled in for Annie Weshey, uh, who was unavailable for this particular week, and did a graphic for me, and she did a great one. So this is called The Wrong Door. I, I went back and forth on titles, as you could only imagine I did. Uh, and uh, I, whether or not this is a good one, I'm still, it's, it's debatable. Uh, but I'm going to establish something first off, which many of you have heard probably many times. It's a, just a, an illustration or an idea that helps us understand something. I call it the work glove. But if you were to look at God's power, his grace, his enabling spirit as a hand, which is invisible, then that hand, though it is able to accomplish great things, you can't see it. And so if it waves at you, you don't see it. If it points at you, you don't see it. If it beckons you, you don't see it. But if you were to take a work glove and set it over that invisible, then suddenly, if the work glove yields to that hand, when that hand waves, you would see it. Why? Because the work glove, which is visible, is revealing that which is invisible. And if it points, you would see it. Why? Because that, that which is visible is revealing the movements of that which is invisible. And if it beckoned, you would see it. You see, what I just described is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the visible representation of the invisible God. And so he became a work glove. And as a result, he rested, he yielded, he submitted himself to the Father and only spoke that which the Father was speaking, only did that which the Father was doing. And as a result, when he moved, when he did what he did, we saw the Father. Now what's extra amazing about that isn't just that Jesus did that, but then he gives us an assignment to follow him. And in a sense, what he's basically saying is, look, I designed you as work gloves, but something is stuffed inside of you called self. And if you would empty out that self and come and rest yourself upon that invisible hand, I will fill you with my Holy Spirit, and I will enable you to express to this world exactly what I would want to express to them. And what I just described is Christianity. So we are work gloves, and apart from that hand, we're rather pathetic. I don't know if you've ever seen a work glove apart from a hand and given it a chore. Like, give it a task, a command. Pull that weed, and then give it a, you know, an opportunity to show itself. Well, that work glove can do nothing apart from that hand. Nothing that it was truly designed for. So unless you could say that we're designed to flop. But we're not designed to flop. We're designed to reveal the movements of that which is invisible. Christianity, in its very essence, is that. It is not us attempting in our own work glove, calfskin power to accomplish and reveal a righteousness that is not our own, but it is one that comes humbly before God and says, I am not as I ought to be. Something is wrong with me. And God says, yes, but I have given you the remedy. And if you would give up your life, 
and you would submit it to me and allow me to take hold of it, then I will use that work glove known as you to show forth my glory. And that, in essence, is a summary of the work of the gospel in us. It's a good news that transforms us and ultimately has the potential to transform the world around us. Ephesians 4.1. Now here's where I'm calling it the wrong door. I'm saying that something gets off in our mechanics. Because what I just said, I mean, for most of you, you're probably in here going, yeah, amen. That's exactly right. And yet, we don't always functionally live out our Christianity based on that premise. In other words, you can know it intellectually, but functionally, we oftentimes veer away from the truth in the way we live out our Christianity. Now, I'm going to show you a scripture. It's up on the screen right now, but Ephesians 4.1. This very scripture, to me personally, I don't want to call it a tripping point because it's God's word. It's not a tripping point. It's just that for whatever reason, the way I used to handle scripture when I was young, and I was eager and I was zealous, I came to Ephesians 4.1 and I saw what I was looking for. Because a lot of us, and I don't know how many of you are like me, I'm a very disciplined, hardworking guy, and I want to please God. So God, tell me what I need to do for you. And then what do I stumble into? Ephesians 4.1. This is like dream territory for the way Eric is wired naturally. I, therefore, so this is actually a conclusion. Paul is concluding after three chapters in a book, and, but that's oftentimes overlooked. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which, with which, sorry, with which you were called. So what does Eric hear? Eric, you've been called. With me? You, you've called me? You've been called, and I want you to walk worthy of that calling. Huh. All right. I'm going to, Lord, you have called me, and I'm going to walk worthy of that calling. And where do I go? I go to my own pockets. And I dig in my own pocket and say, God, I want to I show you that you didn't make a bad choice. You made the right choice when you picked Eric Ludi. I'm going to show you. And then I grit my teeth and I go after it. And I try and restrain myself. I try and hold every thought captive to the will of Christ Jesus. I try and love others. I try and rejoice in suffering. And I fail over and over and over again. And I get so frustrated with myself because I I should be able to do this. Lord, I want to walk worthy. And I don't feel like this is walking worthy. And so what what I'm laying out for you is just a premise that when you start your Christianity in Ephesians chapter four, instead of in Ephesians chapter one, you're walking into the gospel or into the kingdom of heaven through the wrong door. There's all sorts of various access points to things, just like we see in Pilgrim's Progress, those two characters that hop over the wall, and they skip the cross. You see, there's different ways to access this kingdom, and there's only one access point that actually unlocks the grace of God in our life, and we need to enter through the correct door. There is a reason why Paul wrote three chapters before that statement, and it wasn't accidental. And there's a reason why he says, okay, therefore, in light of these three chapters, now I want you to walk worthy. The only way to walk worthy is you need what is in those three chapters. If you skip over those three chapters and launch your Christianity out of chapter four, even if you mean well, you're going to fall flat on your face. The strange mistake believers often make. We do exactly that. With good intention. We mean well. In other words, if you were to put some type of monitor on Eric, you know, put it on my wrists, on my forehead, and it's like, so Eric, do you genuinely want to please God? Yes, I do. It's like, ding, ding, ding. He's telling the truth. In other words, it's not that I'm lying. I'm not a con man. I genuinely want to please my God. And yet God has to bring me to the place where I fail and allow me to trip so I could look back up and say, God, is it me that is the problem or is your truth just not work? And sometimes we have to come to the end of ourselves before we're ready to recognize that we went through the wrong door. 
So this is a pretty pathetic picture. I, I, I searched for side profile of house, and I didn't spend a lot of time, I have to admit. However, that isn't where you enter. Imagine if you were trying to get to the second level there, which is what we're most likely to do. We want to elevate our game. I want to live a life worthy. And yet there is a proper way to enter this house, and yet when you try and you know, loft into the second uh, story window, and crash in, you break some glass as you're doing it. Uh, I'm not sure how you did it. You know, if it was like a, uh, what do you call that when you run and you stick that pole in the ground? Okay, pole vault. If you pole vaulted in, I'm not sure how you did it or why we even tried this, but we're entering the wrong way. So I'm going to show you, and I'm just going to do a, a skim milk version of this because there's 70, I think, 70 scriptures that I'm going to click through in the next few minutes here. And I'm only going to highlight a few just for our sake, okay? Not, you can still see them on the screen, and I want you to see that after Ephesians 4, so Ephesians 4 through 6 has so much good stuff. If you want to figure out how you're supposed to live your life, Ephesians 4 through 6 will tell you exactly how you're supposed to do it. However, I'm forewarning you right now. I know it's attractive, and I know most of us are just like wanting to know, okay, what, God, what do you want me to do? However, if you don't have Ephesians 1 through 3, you're not going to be able to do these things. And so, as a result, even though this is an impressive list and very attractive to the legalistic propensities that some of us have, this is dangerous if it is detached from Ephesians 1, 2, and 3. So I just want to get you the flavoring of it. And so you'll notice that there's, I don't know, what, about seven on each page, and I start with, walk worthy of the calling you've received. And then at the bottom, I have put off the old man. But there's a whole bunch in between. They're good, good things, too. Put on the new man. Put away lying. Stop stealing. Do not speak corrupt words. Speak only that which builds up others. Be kind to one another. Be tenderhearted toward one another. Forgive one another even as Christ forgave you. Be imitators of God. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us. Walk as children of light. Understand what the will of the Lord is. Be filled with the Spirit. Sing and make melody in your heart to the Lord. Give thanks always for all things. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. Be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God. Take up the whole armor of God. Stand praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. There is a huge list of things that you need to be doing. And you could create that list, which is, would be an impressive list, and I'm not saying you shouldn't. However, there's like 70 items on this list that are very clearly stated that this is how you are supposed to live. So is that a good thing or a bad thing? It's a good thing. However, it becomes a bad thing when it is detached from chapters 1, 2, and 3. Because chapters 1, 2, and 3 show you how you can do all of this. And we naturally default to thinking that the way that we live our Christianity is in our own gumption, our own resolve, our own gritted teeth. And it's weird because even as I'm saying that, some of you are like, yeah, but amen, Eric, that isn't how you should live it. But then you think about it a little deeper, like, yeah, but that is, that is what makes the most sense. Well, how could we lean on something other than those things? What else is there? And I could say, well, that's a good question. It's called the power of the gospel. You see, we live our lives as believers not in our doing, but in his doing in and through us. When he does his doing in and through us, it does not mean we don't do anything. We do participate, but we don't participate in our raw strength. We yield, we obey. We allow, and when we do that, we reveal the kingdom of heaven, just as a work glove reveals the invisible hand. So Ephesians 4 through Ephesians 6, what is this? It's commands. There's a fancy word for it. They're called imperatives, but I don't want you to get lost in the big words. There's another word that we could use, which sounds a little strange when you say it in the New Testament, the laws, because they're not laws like Old Testament laws, 
But in a sense, they are the rule book. This is the standard. This is how you are expected to live if you are carrying the life of God in you. And there is a reason why we are given this. It does steer us and it does direct us and it does refine us and it does convict us. It is essential. It is not a negative. It is not an evil. It is just that it cannot be the lead instrument. You cannot start with these commands, these imperatives, and end with the glory of God. You must start with the gospel. When you follow the law instead of the gospel, it really messes things up. The gospel must be our lead. We must start in chapter 1. Or another way of saying it is, we must go in the front door. So Paul is going to build this house for us called the book of Ephesians. And he's going to put a front door on there and he's going to say, hey guys, this is where we enter. However, the way that many of us have been raised to handle our Bibles is sort of the flop open method and then you read a scripture. And we have a tendency to take our favorite scriptures and stick them on the refrigerator. I'm not saying this is a bad thing. But as a result, we pick and choose and we study sort of with a random nature as opposed to in the entirety of something. But if you're going to approach Ephesians, it really helps to go in through the front door. And there's no better lesson in that than the book of Ephesians, the book of Colossians, because both of them have the imperatives and the commands at the second half. And so if you just randomly pick a really cool scripture in there and say, oh, this is exactly what God is saying, it is what God is saying, but he also wants you to know this to be able to interpret this and to understand those commands. So here's the layout of the book of Ephesians. You'll see that the indicatives, I know that's a big word, and how about uh, this, the imperatives, uh, another big word, they, those start in chapter 4. So there's a better way of looking at it. The facts and the commands. God is going to lay out that which is true. He's going to say, you believe this, and then you'll be able to do this. And so you have the facts and the commands, but here's even a better way of saying it. Faith in these facts leads to supernatural living. And this is the sort of living that you can now do if you have faith in these facts. So then it becomes very intriguing. Aren't you fascinated with Ephesians 1 through 3? It's like, huh. See, I should stop the message right there and really work on our Bible study by just creating intrigue and then you know, drawing out and saying, amen, let's, let's be done. And say, you go off and study uh, what you need to believe in so that you can live this amazing life. However, that's not as fun as I really would like this morning, which is I'd like to sort of meditate upon those amazing facts, too. So Colossians 2, 20 through 23 is going to talk about this very propensity that we have as humans. Therefore, if you died with Christ in the basic principles of the world, why as though living in the world you subject yourselves to regulations? Do not touch, do not taste, do not handle, which all concern things which perish, perish with the using, according to the commandments and doctrines of men. These things indeed have an appearance of wisdom in self-imposed religion, false humility, and neglect of the body, but are of no value against the indulgence of the flesh. Many of us have had personal experience with this very understanding, where with good intention, we have said, I am going to restrain these dimensions of my life in order to try and please God. And so we give effort to try and prove that we were a good choice of God. He, he made a good choice when he picked me, and I'm going to live in such a way that honors you. However, when you create a rule system for your life, and you make law your focus in order to please God, that if I could just do these things, then I will please God. God has to prove to us that that isn't how he is pleased. He is pleased through faith. So when we humble ourselves and say, God, I am unable to do these things, but you are able. So Lord, I put my confidence in you, in your work on the cross, and I know that that is where my righteousness comes from. It'll never come from me performing these good deeds by being perfect and pure and moral over here. It comes from you being perfect, pure, and moral. And I find that is my hiding place. And then I believe, Lord, that you will live through me and enable me in this body to actually live a life that truly reflects you. But it's not because of me and my ability. It's because of you and your ability. 
2 Timothy 3.5, having a form of godliness, remember this scripture is at the end of a long list of things uh, that are going to overtake the world and show that the flesh is ruling in the hearts of men. Having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof from such turn away. You see, how many of us have had a form of godliness with no power? And that's Ephesians 4 through 6 without 1 through 3. That's the power is 1 through 3. And so you have a form of godliness where you're attempting to live in your exterior life in a way that is beautiful and moral and righteous, when in actuality, it's empty and hollow and you're, you're living a cover-up existence. You don't want anyone to actually know what is really happening because you don't have the power to live it. The power to live it is available to us. A seed in its two parts. Now look at this. I actually got a little picture. It's very impressive. Uh, uh, but that outer, I think it's called the seed crust. I'm not, not positive. I'm not a seed expert. Now, the inside, to say that there's only two parts to a seed would be, for a seed expert, very offensive because there's all sorts of parts to a seed. However, I'm going to divide it into two parts. You have the outer shell and you have the inner pith. And it's the inner pith that has the life. And you'll see that, look at that, there's some life in that inner pith. That's where the growth is. That's where the reproductive element is. However, it does not mean the outer husk doesn't have value. Because if I were to say, so which one is more valuable, the inner or the outer uh, side? You'd probably lean towards the inner, of course, in a message like this, right? However, the outer has value because if you were to remove this, the, the crust, that, that seed shell area, from this inner pith, it would dry up and it wouldn't live. And so it actually is a preservative. The same is true with what we could call the biblical worldview and the gospel worldview. The biblical worldview, a lot of Christians live off of a biblical worldview. There's entire training schools and colleges that work off of a biblical worldview. We're going to think and reason scripturally. We're going to build government off of this, build our economic system off of this. Very wise, and I'm not going to say it's a bad idea. However, it will not save. An external husk of a culture that is based on biblical principles does not necessarily transform the human soul. What you need for that is the gospel. But that does not mean that the biblical worldview is not good. It just needs to have the life in it. And the same is true with our life. Our life is like this as well. And God wants to root us and surround us with the truth, with solid doctrine, yes. But he wants us to understand the gospel, to yield up our life and to allow him to come in and move into our existence and have it. And that is the essential ingredient that is going to happen through Ephesians 1 through 3. Any of us, if we're going to get the commission to live this impossible life, which it is, Ephesians 4 through 6 is impossible, and yet we've been given the commission. If we're going to walk worthy of the calling we've received, this is the life we're supposed to live. However, the way we live it is by His power, not by our resolve, determination, and discipline. So let's do a practice run in dividing the external husk from the internal pith. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stick some biblical worldview on the the screen. It's a fact. It's true. And yet if we stop there and we just end the discussion right there and I say, okay, guys, go and do it. Uh, I'm not sure if you know yet what's going to happen, but let me give it to you. 1 John 3, 9. You must not sin. Okay. Uh, have you ever tried? Have you ever seen a scripture like that and just decided, okay, God, I'm going to not sin anymore then? And yet, in and of itself, it doesn't have the solution for how you don't sin. Just right there. However, the solution is in scripture, and that's called the gospel. So what you need is not just the biblical worldview. You need the gospel. So let's add that in. He conquered sin. 1 Peter 2.24. You see, when you approach sin and your problem with it as if it is you that needs to conquer it, you are starting at the wrong end. You're entering through the wrong door. What you need to start with is the premise is he conquered it. Therefore, you're going to find the solution for sin in Jesus Christ, not in your resolve, your hatred of it. It is found in the person of Jesus Christ, and that's how the gospel works. 
you must be righteous, Deuteronomy 18, 13. Now, many of us have felt this one. It's like, I'm supposed to be righteous. That is actually the requirements of the law. If you want to have anything to do with God, if you want to enter into his holy domain, you need to be righteous. That is a total setup in the Old Testament to prove one thing. We are not righteous. That's what he's doing for us. He's showing us that the law cannot save, but the law is speaking truth just like Ephesians 4 through 6 is. However, the New Testament is different than the Old. It does not first need to prove to us our need. It wants to show us the solution and then show us that now we can fulfill that which we never could. You must be righteous. It's still a fact. It's still true. But here's the gospel added to it. 2 Corinthians 5.21. He is indeed our righteousness. Now that is a game changer. When you begin to recognize that, yes, God intends you to be righteous, but where do you find your righteousness? You find it in the person of Jesus Christ. By faith in Jesus, you are clothed in his righteousness. You do not gain righteousness by your good deeds. You gain righteousness by his good deed. But when you find your refuge in his righteousness and he fills you with his Holy Spirit, what do you start doing with your life? Good deeds. But you're not saved by those good deeds. Those are merely the evidence that you have discovered the gospel life. Let's try another one. You must be holy just as God is holy. Whew, there's a heavy duty one. That's 1 Peter 1.15. Well, you try and live that out. You try and be holy as God is holy. Dig in your own pockets and try and pull that one off. But there is a secret, guys. Look at this. The Holy Spirit has been given you. Romans 5.5. 5. How did you expect to be holy? You see, this is the secret of holiness. You need the Holy Spirit. You need God to live in you. He's holy. You are a pathetic, cheap imitation that does not translate well into the heavenly realms, which is why you need Jesus. And you need to humble yourself and acknowledge that your attempts at righteousness, your attempts at holiness, fall far short of the heavenly standard, but his doesn't. And find your confidence in his work. He can do it. He is truly holy, righteous, perfect, and good. And you find that as your salvation. You cling to it. You clothe yourself in it. You go to it like a strong tower and find refuge in it. And as a result, your life can be filled with the very Spirit of God who is holy. And as a result, the fruit that begins to come out of your life is what? It's fruit of the Holy Spirit spirit. It's holy fruit. You must love just as God loves. That's John 13, 34. You ever tried to whip up love in your life? Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to love everyone. The first day you start doing it, someone really gets under your skin and you realize you're not very good at this. We are not the source of love. He is. And so when we try and dig in our own pockets to love as God loves, it's like we're starting in Ephesians chapter 4. Instead of going back to Ephesians chapter 1 and recognizing he is the source of all things. We are going to find our salvation in him. We're going to find our love in him. He is love. And as a result, he sheds his love abroad in our hearts so that we can give his love. Not our love, his love. God is love. This is 1 John four sixteen, And he will love in and through you. So what I would like to do now, and I'm going to actually read through these. I'm going to go through 40 gospel indicatives found in chapters 1 and 2. So these are going to be the facts. This is that which you should believe in. When you enter into Christ, I have a message that's called reckoning with truth. And what you do is you take these into your account. You take these as yours by faith. That's actually how we're supposed to function as believers. And so as I read through this list, in some regards, it almost feels too good to be true. I was like, what? That's been sitting there the whole time? It's been ours the entire while. However, when you start in Ephesians chapter 4, it does not mean you do not have sincerity. You just need truth to undergird that. So go back to chapter 1 and build your understanding of how this life is to be lived. So let's start. And you're going to see on the, on the right side, you're going to see the verse. 
Okay, so like 13141414415. So I'm just going to read through these. We have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. He chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. He chose us in Christ to be holy. He chose us in Christ to be blameless before him in love. He predestined us to adoption as sons. He made us accepted in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood. In him we have forgiveness of sins. In him the riches of his grace abound toward us in wisdom. In him the riches of his grace abound toward us in prudence. In him the mystery of his will is made known to us. In him we have obtained an inheritance. In him we were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. If we were to just stop right there, we are so overwhelmed with the massive amount that he has blessed us with. What did we do? We believed. What did that do for us? It brought us into Christ. So as a result, we are in Christ. So these things are ours. Just like when you're in a plane, you are able to conquer the law of gravity. And it's like God saying to you, you can conquer the law of gravity in the plane. We're like, I can't conquer the law of gravity, I've tried. He's like, well, get in the plane. If you're in the plane, I will conquer the law of gravity for you. And that's precisely what is taking place. These are yours. If you are in faith, if you believe in Christ, these things are yours. Take them. Live from them. We may receive wisdom and knowledge of Christ. The eyes of our understanding can be enlightened to know the hope of our calling, the riches of the glory of his inheritance, the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe, the power of Christ's resurrection, the present position, the present preeminent position and authority of Christ Jesus enthroned in the heavenly places. He has quickened us, made us alive. He has made us alive together with Christ. He has saved us by grace. He has raised us up together with, with him to heavenly places. He has made us sit together with him in heavenly places. We are saved by grace through faith. We are not saved by ourselves, by any of our works. We were saved by the gift of God. We are his workmanship. We are created in Christ Jesus. We are created in Christ Jesus unto good works. God has works for us to walk in that he ordained long ago. In Christ, we who were far off have been brought near to God by the blood of Jesus. Christ is our peace. Christ has made us one with God. Christ has broken down the middle wall of partition between us. Christ has reconciled us unto God. We have access by one spirit unto the Father. We are no longer strangers and foreigners to the household of God. We are fellow citizens with the saints. We are now of the household of God. We are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. We are built upon Jesus Christ as the chief cornerstone. In Christ, we are being built and growing into a holy temple. In Christ, we are being built as a dwelling place of God through the Spirit. Now, I literally didn't even get to chapter 3. That's just chapter 1 and 2. That's just a foundation just to whet your appetite. We have been given everything we need to live out this life with triumph. However, many of us skip over that incredible piece of news and go straight into our attempts to show God that he made a good decision. I bet in this room, if we were to look at the authenticity meter, the genuine desire meter, it's very, very high. We want to please our God. We want him to know that we love him and cherish the fact that he gave up his life for us. And yet the best way to do that is to not just attempt in your own strength to be good, but it's to freshly cling to his goodness and say, God, apart from you, I am not good. Apart from you, I am not holy. Apart from you, I'm not righteous. I need what you gave, and I cherish and thank you for this great gift called salvation. And Lord, I freshly remember, freshly uh, resolve, freshly reckon myself to be in Christ Jesus by faith. And that is the great movement of our soul, it's to believe. That is our greatest action, our greatest work is to believe. And when we do, we are given grace to now function. So we can actually love, but we know where the love comes from. God, this isn't my love I'm trying to drum up. I want your love to be shed abroad in my heart, and then I want to give that. 
Lord, it's not my joy where I'm trying to convince myself to rejoice right now, but I am accessing your joy from your throne room of grace, and that is what I want to rejoice with. I choose to be a believer, and when you function out of that believing relationship with God, you have supply to live out Ephesians 4 through 6. So this was, let's yield to the almighty hand. So remember we're gloves, and inside of us are all these hankies that are, if you pull them out and look at them, it says self on them, and it's all stuffed in there. It's a whole bunch of us, and what God wants to do is pull out all that is self in us to empty us so that he can fill us, and then he can express his life in and through us. So let's practice. So here's a, a common thing uh, that can happen in the human psyche. It's a, it's a statement, I'm unwanted. Now where did that thought come from? I guarantee you it didn't come from God, right? Because it's not true. You're, you think you're unwanted? Have you not read Ephesians 1 through 3? He predestined us to adoption as sons. He made us accepted in the Beloved. You see, what Ephesians 1 through 3 offers isn't just a bit of encouragement. It gives you weaponry to stand for the truth when the enemy comes in with his lies. You see, we find our fortress in Ephesians 1 through 3, and we have an answer when the enemy comes in to belittle, when he comes in to undermine, when he comes in to discourage. We have something to wield. I'm unforgivable. In him, we have the forgiveness of sins. I'm undesirable. He chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. In Christ, we who were far off have been brought near to God by the blood of Jesus. You are desirable. I'm cut off. We are no longer strangers and foreigners to the household of God. We are fellow citizens with the saints. We are now of the household of God. I'm dead in my sin. I'm powerless to live. You ever felt that? It's like, God, no matter how hard I've tried, I can't get out of this mess. Well, there is an answer to that. He has quickened us, made us alive. And what we need to do as the church of Jesus Christ is remember that. Not just remember it, believe it. Believe it, as I like to say, afresh. Believe it now, in this moment. And don't let the enemy try and con you out of your inheritance in Christ. He has quickened us and made us alive. He has made us alive together with Christ. So here's our key line that has tripped Eric in the past, and maybe it's tripped you. I'm not sure. I must walk worthy of the calling I have received. Oh, how in the world am I supposed to do that? So listen to this. We have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. We are his workmanship. God has works for us to walk in that he ordained long ago. God, how am I supposed to live worthy of this? Well, Eric, I've given you everything you need in Christ. Everything has been supplied. I've even done the work ahead of time. So you just need to walk in it. You need to allow me to do what I do best. And that's Christianity. I need help living this out. You ever had that thought? That's a good thought. That's a spirit-born thought. That's not a bad thought. That's a really good thought. God, I need help. He's like, you're right. You do. In him we were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. He has raised us up together with him to heavenly places. He has made us sit together with him in heavenly places. We are saved by grace through faith. We were not saved by ourselves, by any of our works. We were saved by the gift of God. So Colossians is based on the same premise. So what you see is up to chapter 2, verse 6, you're going to have the facts, the facts that you need to believe in. And ironically, if you compare it with Ephesians, they're the same facts. And it's just written slightly different, but it's beautiful. It's beautiful when you study Ephesians to study Colossians, and when you study Colossians to study Ephesians. And then what does that do? Faith in these facts leads to supernatural living. And that supernatural living, that commission, is revealed in Colossians from 
from chapter 2, verse 6 on to the end of chapter 4. So listen to Colossians 2, verse 6 and 7. So this is where the transition is going to stop or start, where you have your incredible facts, where God is laying out the gospel, and then he's going to transition right here. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. So what you have is Paul doing the very same thing where he starts to reference what was just said. Therefore, as a result of these amazing facts that you are believing in, now, see in Ephesians it says walk worthy, and this one it says walk in him. And I think that helps. You see, when you hear walk in him, it, it actually triggers a different line of thought than walk worthy. When I hear walk worthy, I say, yes, sir. Yes, sir, and I dig in my own pockets. By default, it's like, what's wrong with you, Eric? Well, I think it's something that might be wrong with all of us. We instinctively go to ourselves as a solution instead of to God. That's one of our big problems. And God wants to teach us to walk in him. If we're going to walk worthy, we need to walk in him. So there's our statement, Ephesians 4.1, walk worthy. And I put an exclamation mark behind it just to you know, make us feel the weight of it. However, the solution is to walk in him, which is Colossians 2.6. If you're going to walk worthy, you need to walk in him. And that is the great inheritance that we've received, is we can be in Christ Jesus. Literally, in him, in his work. We can share in his amazing work on the cross. And as Paul says, we died with him. We were crucified with Christ. When he was buried, we were buried. When he rose, we rose to newness of life in Christ Jesus. And when he ascended, we ascended and we were seated with him in heavenly places. We are actually in the work of Christ. Therefore, if we are going to live this life, this Christian life out on this earth, we need to do it by walking in him, by walking in stride with his Holy Spirit. By agreeing with him. Just like if you're going to overcome the law of gravity, you need to do it in a plane. And the same is true with us. If we're going to reveal the righteousness of God, if we're going to reveal the morality of God, if we're going to reveal the perfection of God, boy, to do that in our own strength is laugh out loud ridiculous. But if we enter into him and we allow him to bear his fruit in and through us, this world will see the goodness, the perfection, the morality, the wonder, the righteousness of God in and through the church of Jesus Christ. He has chosen us as the vehicle of revelation to show forth his profound heavenly wisdom to this world. This is his choice. Isn't it funny he chose us to do that? God, but you would be so much better at showing this yourself. He says, but I've chosen to indwell you to fill you with my very life, to give you all spiritual blessing so that you could participate with me in doing what I desire to do for this world, is, and that's show them me. What an amazing privilege we have. Father, I pray that we would freshly yield. We would freshly believe we would allow you to reach into that work glove that is us and yank out all those hankies of self and that we would give up our way and that we would remember that the only way that works is yours. Lord, we want to be believers today. We want to be found trusting in you, in your righteousness, not in our own. Lord, Thank you for your truth, and thank you that we as the body of Christ have access to it, that you love us so much as to reveal these truths and to even say them to us over and over and over and over again. Lord, may we heed them, and may we walk in them. It's in the precious name of Jesus that we pray this. Amen. Isaac's going to lead us in worship.